everyone, my name is Matt. Thanks for being here. Our church is in this new series called Psalms, Songs for the Soul. We're walking through a handful of selected Psalms that capture what it means to be human and that God is present in our brokenness. Before I get to Nathan, as he talks about how we deal with worry and anxiety, I wanna share some things about Reunion and how you can connect with us. Reunion is one church in two locations with a simple mission of helping people find a way back to God. We believe we are all trying to find our way, especially after these last couple of years, and we invite you to do it with us in community. For those of you who are just coming across our YouTube channel for the first time, let me be the first one to welcome you. We're so glad you found us online. No matter where you are in your faith journey, you are welcome here. If you are in the Boston area and looking for a community to explore faith with, we invite you to participate in one of our in-person gatherings on Sunday mornings. We normally meet in Davis Square in Somerville and in downtown Boston, but this month of August, we are meeting outside at a park as one church. You can find all the details somewhere here on the screen and also go to our website, reunionboston.com. If you have your phone handy, also feel free to scan the QR code using your camera and it will take you directly to our digital connection card. Fill out the card and we'll reach out to answer any questions you may have and help you get you plugged in. We'll get you signed up for The Loop, our weekly newsletter that shares all of the different ways you can engage with us. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and on Instagram. That's a great way for you to find out what's going on at Reunion. Now I'd like to introduce Nathan as he continues our series, Psalms, Songs for the Soul. Hey everyone, my name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here at Reunion and I'm really excited to be hanging out with all of you this morning. You know, this last week, me and my wife, Emily, were talking about an upcoming trip that we're taking. We're um, flying to Colorado next month to see some family. And I can kind of openly confess that I have a fear of flying. I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. I have no interest in it. I cannot wait until we figure out teleportation so I don't have to fly places anymore. I'm, I'm begging anybody that is connected to that, please get on that for my sake. Anyways, we're talking about all the details and I just started to notice as we're having this conversation, I had this kind of low grade nervousness that started to come over me. It was like I could sense it, but I couldn't exactly put my finger on it or, or communicate what it was. And I tried to explain it to Emily and I'd tell her what was going on, but I just couldn't quite make sense of it. And she looked at me actually and said, it's okay, you're feeling anxious. I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, we haven't flown in a long time. You don't like flying. And we've been talking about it for a half hour now. We can talk about something else while your anxiety kind of settles down and goes away. And I was so appreciative to have someone there who could identify what was going on in me when I was in a place where I couldn't find words to describe it myself. Last week, we kicked off this brand new series called Psalms, Songs for the Soul. And during this series, we want to explore one of the most diverse books of the Bible that captures the essence of what it means to be human. Nowhere else in the Bible do we see such a poetic expression of raw emotion and what it means to connect to God in the midst of our complex lives. So this summer, we're going to walk through a handful of selected Psalms that take us deep into our hearts and help us remember that God is present in our brokenness. And that experience that I had with Emily, that is often what the book of songs and, and these songs and these poems do for us. It's a book that gives language to some of our thoughts and experiences that we don't know how to give voice to ourselves. It allows us to see what it looks like to be honest and vulnerable with God as we process our feelings. And I think we need a series like this now more than ever, maybe. I mean, data is continuing to show that anxiety and worry are not just something that we might have to deal with, but they are actually an epidemic that is taking place in our culture today. A recent survey done by Pew Research found that over 50% of people said they experience at least one to two days of anxiety and worry over a seven day period. And actually 31% of that 50 plus percent said that they felt anxious for three or more days with some saying they felt anxious almost every 
day. The research continues to point to the same fact. Anxiety is at an all-time high, especially for millennials and Gen Z. And in truth, it makes sense. I mean, we live in a setting where there is an endless amount of things to be anxious about. And those things are constantly thrown in our face. We are bombarded with information that almost always says the same thing. You should be anxious. You should be worried. This is how newsrooms up their viewership. This is how so many outlets make their money. And it doesn't matter what side of the political sphere you are on, because you can turn on Fox News or you can turn on CNN, and they will both tell us to be anxious about the same thing just for different reasons. No one is tuning into that news to have them tell you that everything is great or that this event just happened in the White House today, but actually we don't have to stress about it at all. It's not that big of a deal. That's not how they make money. We've noticed in the rise of clickbait articles, click here to see why this is happening. Click this, check out what he said, read why she did this. We're still living with some anxiety around COVID. What does that mean for us? Are we ever going to feel a sense of peace and relief from this pandemic? There's financial inflation. How do we afford to live in a place like Boston. There are mass shootings that are happening. There is war. And then there's experiences of worry that we have on a personal level. We want to get married. We want to have kids. We want to buy a house. We want meaningful friendships in a disconnected world. What do we do? I mean, some of us, we try to outwork it. If we can clear our schedules, finally catch up on everything take that vacation get a little rest maybe the anxiety will finally subside but what happens when that doesn't work i mean summers in boston are the time where life seems to slow down or at least we think it's supposed to slow down we take some vacations we go on hikes we go to the beach but when i talk to people it doesn't seem like there has been a mass release from anxiety And it's not like we don't just find more things to fill our schedule with anyway. Some of us try to outrun it. Maybe if we just stay busy enough or we try to surround ourselves with enough friends, we can keep the worry buried just deep enough below the surface that we don't have to think about it or we don't have to deal with it. We can just keep going. And when it does not rise to the surface or when it does finally rise to the surface, We'll just hang out with some friends or we'll turn on our favorite Netflix show and we can bury it down again. Some of us, we try to escape it. What I mean is that we try to create so much happiness or so much comfort in our life, hoping that that is what will finally get rid of our worry. So we buy the new toy or we go to the restaurant or we try the new experience or we drink the drink, whatever helps us escape the worry. And if we do it enough, we'll create enough pleasure and happiness, then the worry will finally go away. All of these ideas, they're us looking for short-term quick fixes to long-term complex problems. What do we do when they don't work? What do we do when the things we try to take refuge in, the place we try to escape to for peace, When those places don't actually create any freedom in the midst of our worry and anxiety. Is there any hope in the midst of it? We're going to jump into uh, Psalms 27, which is a psalm that I think has a lot to say to us about these deeply rooted complex issues. But before we do that, I want to make sure that we define a few terms that we're using just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And Jordan Rice, who's a pastor out of Harlem, New York, did a sermon series where he defined anxiety in two terms. And I think it was incredibly helpful. So I want to just steal what he said and share that for our time today. 
He said, I believe there are two categories of worry and anxiety. There's a biblical concept of anxiety, which the Bible portrays as sinful. The root of anxiety that is described in scripture is a lack of trusting in God and his sovereignty, his control, and his care for us. Simultaneously, there is also a medical anxiety. Biblical anxiety should be dealt with biblically. Medical anxiety should be dealt with medically. I said last week in my sermon that I'm currently in therapy, and I've been going to therapy for about three years now. I have found it to be extremely helpful for me as I've continued to grow into a more healthy person emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. I am a strong advocate that everyone should consider going to therapy. I think all of us would benefit from a little therapy. And today I want to acknowledge that the Bible has a lot to say to us about this season of high anxiety that our culture finds itself in right now. I mean, we would be foolish to assume the Bible doesn't have anything to say about anxiety and worry. But we'd also be foolish to assume that reading a bit more scripture or having a bit more faith is all that we need to do to address the medical anxiety that many of us are facing. Reading your Bible is not a replacement for therapy. I mean, there are plenty of scenarios where we will be extremely benefited when we address our anxiety with things like therapy and in some cases medication. I really am hoping at this point that the stigma around mental health has been broken. But I also know that some of us might have grown up in a setting where those things were looked down on. And again, I think scripture has a lot to say to us and it is a very practical and important tool as we address our worry and anxiety, but that doesn't mean we have to negate therapy as a crucial tool in this process as well. So hopefully we're all on the same page and we're open up our Bibles and turn to the place we're going to be today. Psalm 27. Psalm 27 begins like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. You know, throughout this psalm, we get this really interesting dynamic about what is happening with this internal wrestling of David. And this psalm goes back and forth between the reality of what David is facing and the truth that he is telling himself. Because in one breath, he talks about trusting in the Lord. And then just a verse or two later, he talks about enemies pursuing him and surrounding him, armies attacking him, the wicked advancing upon him. And I think this is a crucial place for us to sit because this reveals a truth for us where we need to begin that David's life was still cluttered with events and realities that would have made him worry and be anxious. If we can 
all agree that the political climate that we find ourselves in today is a reason for worry. I think we could agree that a city being surrounded by an army waiting to destroy us would also be a political climate that might cause some anxiety. In fact, David, his entire life was filled with events like this. One of the tricky things about this particular psalm is that most scholars argue that you can't identify the setting in David's life that it was written because there was so much going on in his life that would have caused him to write this psalm. I mean, he could have been talking about a time he was fleeing King Saul a king that was unrightfully trying to kill him. He could have been talking about a time where Goliath was shouting across the battlefield, challenging any Israelite that would face him. He could have been talking about the multiple wars that faced Israel while David was king. He could have been talking about the moments that David's family turned against him when his children rebelled and wished him ill. All of these moments would have been reason for David to worry. And it's important that we're honest about that. It reminds us that David's life circumstances weren't the thing that allowed him to experience peace. When David looked around at what he was experiencing, he would have been anxious as well. And in this psalm, David is honest about those things. He doesn't hide from them. He doesn't pretend they aren't real. He doesn't say, I have all this going on, but don't worry, God. I'm going to put my head down and get to work so I can get rid of all these worries. And in truth, that's what many of us do. Like I said, maybe we try to outwork our worries or outrun them or bury them or distract ourselves from them. The problem is when we try to do that, when we work at all those things, when we try to do all of those things, our worries and anxieties become the thing that we focus on. We have a way of spiraling when we give our worries this kind of power in our lives. There's a Jewish rabbi and psychologist named Edwin Friedman, and he introduced an idea that is known as the five-stage vicious cycle of anxiety. And he suggests that we fall into this cycle of worry and anxiety. And ultimately, in the fourth stage, it's this idea that we attempt to work our way out of our own worry ourselves. And we do it with a quick fix like the ones that we've talked about. But when that doesn't work, the cycle continues and on and on we spiral down. But David, he doesn't get caught in that cycle. The way that he breaks the cycle and the way that it's suggested to break the cycle is to have a non-anxious presence enter into the process. And that is what David does when he runs to God. I mean, look at what he says again in a few of the verses that we just read. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. David's trust was in the presence of God in the midst of his worry and anxiety. He said that God was his stronghold, meaning even though all these anxieties were still forcing in on him, he ran to God for peace and safety. He ran to God for comfort in the midst of uncomfortable moments. And he did this because he understood that God is a worthy stronghold. When other strongholds crumble, God's presence remains firm. So many other places we try to make our strongholds can disappear in a moment, but God never will. The most important thing can never be taken away from us. I mean, David doesn't try to break the cycle himself. He names the worries that he is experiencing. He is self-aware enough to notice what he is experiencing, and then he's open and honest about those realities with God. And when David does this, it's important that we know when he names his anxieties to God, he is releasing control of those to God, meaning he takes this opportunity to rest in God rather than resting in himself. 
God is his stronghold. God is his salvation. He is the one who will ultimately keep David safe and receive him. You see, in this psalm, the psalm is reminding us that the same non-anxious presence is available to us. The invitation is to release our desire to break out of the cycle of anxiety on our own that we don't need to work harder or buy more things or experience more things or whatever, but we can run to Jesus, that he can be our stronghold. These things that David is mentioning, they aren't casual fears. They're life and death circumstances. I mean, of course they are causing him to worry. In fact, stats today still state that death is one of the, if not the primary fear that we currently have. But David, in these life and death moments, what he did is he trusted that God was with him, that God was going to keep him. Instead of grasping for control in a situation that he was never gonna get control of, he trusted in the person who was above the situation. He put his faith in the one who ultimately had control. I'm not sure if there's a better modern day example of what this looked like uh, than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The night before he was assassinated, Dr. King gave an extremely powerful speech, one I'm sure that many of us have heard. And in it, he says these unforgettable lines. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like any man, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory, the coming of the Lord with everything, with everything that was happening in Dr. King's life. These words are astounding. Because these words show us the heart of someone who had full confidence in God, the one who had made God their ultimate stronghold. When we've gotten to a place where God is our stronghold, where we can trust him with the ultimate thing, our lives, then why would we not trust him with the worries that we experience every day? Does that mean that our worries and our anxieties are gone forever? Of course not. It simply means that when we experience anxiety, we run to the one who is above the worries. And we know we can trust God with our lives, with our worries. Because like David and Martin Luther King, we know that we can trust God with the ultimate thing. Jesus made sure that we could trust him with our lives. He did that through his life and death on the cross. He made a way for us to experience eternal life now and in the future through his death and resurrection. It was an ultimate act of love that shows us that we can place our faith in him. In John 10 verse 28, Jesus says it this way, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. When Jesus is our stronghold, we can rest in this truth. That no matter what the outcome of our situation is, we are still secure in the hands of Jesus. That he still holds us no matter what happens. That he takes our pain and our worry on himself. Today, some of us We need to simply start by being honest with God and ourselves. 
we have done so much to try to avoid admitting that we are anxious and we need to go to God and simply say, God, I'm, I am anxious. I am worried. And this is why. Name it. Tell God what is truly, truly making you anxious. And once we've done that, we're able to enter into this process that uh, I've heard a few, few therapists call stop writing the scripts. When we're honest about things that are making us anxious, we can start to be honest that part of what is making us anxious is that we're writing a script about how these things are going to play out in our lives, even though they haven't played out yet. So for example, if our boss says that she wants to talk to us this week, some of us have already written a script saying, uh, we're going to get written up or we're going to get punished or we're going to get fired. We write a worst case scenario script about events that haven't played out yet. In God's presence, it allows us to stop writing the script because we get to sit in the presence of the one who has already written the script. What scripts do you need to stop writing? Or some of us need to welcome God as a non-anxious presence in our lives. Throughout this summer series, uh, if you're in the Boston area, we're doing a thing called the morning refresh. And the idea is that we want to create space in our busy lives to come and worship together, to reflect together, to pray together, and to open our eyes to the reality of God's presence among us. It might be a time for us to reflect on our own anxiety, to be honest about it with God, to ask him to be our refuge, a non-anxious present in time, presence in times of need. Have you invited God to be a non-anxious presence in your life? Maybe some of us need to be that non-anxious presence to others. You know, one of the beautiful things about the church community is that we can be a physical representation of a spiritual truth, meaning we can be God's non-anxious presence to each other by being a non-anxious presence for one another. Who can I be a non-anxious presence for? I understand that worry and anxiety, they probably aren't going anywhere anytime soon. But we can, t- we can find a small taste of freedom from them. We can experience a pocket of peace in a worrisome world. We can invite a non-anxious presence into our anxiety-ridden lives. Because Jesus is offering to be our stronghold in difficult seasons. So let's run to him when our hearts are troubled. Let's pray. God, we love you. And um, I just thank you that we can um, come to you and, and just be honest about these difficult topics and circumstances and things that we find in our lives. I know, um, I know the um, weight that anxiety can bear on us. And I know um, that now more than ever, we need a stronghold. We need a non-anxious presence. And I pray that you would be that non-anxious presence. I pray that we could be that non-anxious presence for each other. I pray that we would look uh, to truth in scriptures when anxiety rises up, that we would be honest about um, other things that we can use like therapy, that we would Um, seek healing in the midst of a very um, worrisome and anxious world. And I thank you that you're with us as we walk through that process, as we work towards that healing. I pray that all of us will look to you in this time. We love you. Amen. We're going to come to a time in our gathering where we um, just remember the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's called communion. And we do it each week to pause and to celebrate 
and to be reminded of and to be grateful for Jesus' death on the cross, that he entered into our story, that he made a way for us to have life to the full here and now and in the future. And usually uh, as we do this, we um, like have a piece of bread and it reminds us of the body of Jesus that's broken for us. We uh, drink some juice and it's a representation of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And then we'll kind of sing a song together and we want to do uh, something similar. We want to have that moment of remembrance and then there's going to be a song after that. But I want to invite you during that song, if you need time to uh, be honest about where you're at with God. Maybe right now in this moment is when you need to be real with God. You need to talk to God about the anxieties and the worries that you're experiencing. Name them, and in naming them, invite God to be that non-anxious presence. Ask him to be your stronghold. And I want to create just a little bit of space for us to do that during our final song. And then after that, we'll have a benediction to close our time together. But if you're feeling that worry, if you're experiencing that anxiety, don't hesitate to name that reality to God and ask him to be a part of your process. Let's take communion now together. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His own Beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body 
began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me How oh, Jesus yours Is the victory Let's close now with our benediction, which is a simple closing prayer of blessing. Kind and compassionate God, we invite you to join us now. Many of us are heavy, surrounded by darkness, burdened by fear and worries, helpless in the wake of destruction, stuck in discord and strife. We ask that you sit with us, be with us in those fears, listen to our helplessness and reconcile our strife. Enter this space and fill our dark corners with your clear and brilliant light so that we see ourselves as the people you intended us to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and live the church.